chapter six. Paper boat. Z89 removed the dress and shoes quickly, scratching her shaven head. The black wig that now lay lifeless on the chair in front of her made her head feel hot and sweaty. Carefully removing the scrap of paper Patrick had given her from inside her left shoe, she saw it had been folded into a tiny paper boat, just like the ones he'd given her twice before. She could make out words neatly written and folded into the paper sails. Z89 dressed herself in the white uniform of shapeless shirt and leggings and hid the miniature boat inside the waistband. She would read it once she was back in her nod pod. Opening the door, she saw the nine other Marcon students come out of their respective cubicles adjacent to the green room, and they all walked in line along the sterile white corridors. They passed another queue of ten waiting to go into a learning lab, no one speaking, no one looking right or left. Friendships were not tolerated. This was all part of the programme. She smiled at one, a tall, slim boy, who was very aware of his height and who held himself slightly bowed, his shaved head beginning to show ginger tufts. He smiled back and made no comment, and then he went to scratch his head, but he did it with his thumb and forefinger pressed together to make a teardrop shape. He was in Febcon and often wore grey, just like her. She carried his smile within her as she walked on. It warmed her heart that someone responded to her. The ten Marcon students split into two groups, the girls turning off the main corridor to their nod pods as the boys continued to theirs at the opposite end of the school. Z89 went to climb her ladder. She was exhausted. It had been a long day. Hello, Z89. A sweet, sickly voice came from behind, and Z89 whirled round to face the purple creation that was Esme Dorling, the school principal. How was your enrichment experience today, my dear? Very nice, thank you, Miss Dorling. Z89 was polite and calm on the outside, but inside her stomach was rolling back and forth like the waves on the sea she had only seen in pictures. She didn't want the paper boat hidden in her waistband to be found and set forth onto a sea of destruction. I understand you accepted a gift. Miss Dorling's voice was like liquid toffee that had a brittle quality. Where is it? The voice changed and the face changed like a chameleon coming out of its camouflage and her true being was clear to everyone. She put out her hand like a lizard stretching out its tongue for a fly. Someone f took it from me. I, I didn't keep it. They threw it out of the car, Miss Dorling. Z89 swallowed hard. I never opened it, she finished lamely. Esme Dorling gestured with pointed fingers as though to acquiesce, but then grasped Z89's arm with contempt. The pain was instant. The purple pointed nails dug in deeply and her muscle was twisted sharply. I'm watching you. The proud, skinny woman breathed into Z89's face, her eyes glinting from the stark white light overhead, her stale breath flowing into the young girl's nostrils. Then she was gone, her dagger heels clicking away along the corridor. Z89 realised she was holding her breath and slowly exhaled, a heart pounding. She took a deep breath and climbed the ladder to the side of, of, to the side of her until she reached her nod pod. There she lay on her bed, tears scratching at her eyes. Looking up at the low ceiling, Z89's silent tears slipped down into her hairline. Closing her eyes, an image of a man who makes paper boats and a woman who smiles with her mouth but shows true sadness in her blue eyes, merged with the tears. She'd seen them before, but didn't know who they were. They said they loved her, whatever love is, she thought to herself. Yet she felt a warmth wash over her whenever she saw them, engulfing her like waves of the sea. She pulled out the paper boat, carefully unfolded it, and began to read the message wrapped inside the folds. Butterfly the door to the hotel room opened softly and Stella Winslow peered out, blinking at the hotel manager who stood before her. 
Yes, what do you want? She was abrupt, then frowning hard, she wrapped her thick, toweling dressing gown tightly round her thin body. Her eyes red and swollen, her face looking old in the pale light. Erin noticed as she looked at her mother. The manager explained they had two visitors and asked politely if they were happy for them to visit. Before Stella could reply, Erin pushed past the hotel manager and barged into the room with an apologetic mouth following. She flung herself down into one of the comfy armchairs and waited for her mother to respond. Stella waved the blue-suited man away and nodded her agreement, assuring him they were her children. But we're not your only ch children, are we, Mum? Erin fired at her harassed mother, who looked stricken at seeing her daughter and son. Who is she, then? Where does she live? Why have you kept her hidden all these years? The quick-fire questions Erin shot out hit her mother like bullets. Stella almost physically tried to dodge the sharp words, and when Patrick entered the sitting room, she ran to him for protection. He held her in his arms, and she erupted into more sobs. Come on, love, he soothed and led her to the small sofa. Mal, why don't you put the kettle on, lad? I'm sure we could all do with a cup of tea. Erin sat fuming, drumming her fingers on the armrest, while her brother took control and made tea with a calmness that annoyed her intensely. The only sound was the ticking of a clock and an occasional sob from Stella. Mal handed round cups of strong tea and then perched himself in the armrest next to Erin. That small gesture settled her. She realised he was on her side and together they could find out what was going on. Mal opened the discussion, laying his head gently, hand gently onto Erin's arm. Erin says she saw you both with a girl that looks just like her. We didn't come here to upset you, but we feel we're owed some sort of an explanation. Erin sipped her tea and nodded, afraid of what she might say. She didn't want her mum to be so upset, but she was very confused and suddenly felt very worried. Tears pricked her eyes and exhaustion washed over her. The clock ticked away the seconds, and yet to Erin it was more like hours before her father answered. Patrick finally replied, still holding onto Stella's hands tightly. He looked at his wife searchingly, and she nodded. That was your twin sister, Erin. Her name is Miranda. At that, Erin let out a little sob. Mal put his arm around her, giving her a protective cloak to hide behind. She knew this must be true because of what she'd seen. But to now hear the truth from her dad, her lovely dad who she trusted more than anyone, she could feel her world spiralling out of control. Erin gasped for breath like someone drowning in deep water. She coughed and then emerging from her place of safety, she slowly stood and stumbled to her parents. She fell into their arms and they held her tight. I don't understand. Why did you keep this from me? We had to. No one knows. No one must ever know, Stella finally found her voice. I'm so sorry you had to find out like this. We have been so careful. She looked panic-stricken at Patrick. What if they find out? If who finds out, Malachi asked, what will happen? But why are you being so secretive? You're beginning to worry me. Please, Erin implored, just tell us about Miranda. The air thickened around Erin as she waited for more lies from her parents. She didn't really want to know about this strange girl who looked like her. Conversely, she was desperate to fit the pieces of the puzzle together. I don't know about you lot, but I need something stronger than tea. Patrick made his way to the minibar and pulled out various miniature bottles. He found four glasses and placed everything on the coffee table between them. He broke open a bottle of white wine and passed it to Stella, who was now sitting with Erin at her feet. He helped himself to a whisky, gulping a large mouthful down before speaking. When Mal was born, we were broke. We lived in a tiny bedsit in Milton, above a hair salon. I still remember the smell of the bleaching fluid permeating the flat. Patrick took another large mouthful of the amber-coloured liquid and savoured it for a moment. We had set up a business, but lost everything and were bankrupt. 
I began a job in IT, but it was as a trainee and getting paid a pittance. And then your mum became very depressed. Stella looked sorrowfully at her children. Postnatal depression. It was awful. Anyway, a friend told us about a scheme that could help people like us who are struggling financially. Patrick looked across at Stella for support. Yes, that's right. Stella looked wistfully into her wine and swirled it around the glass. Then I became pregnant again, and when I learned I was expecting twins, we realised we had to do something, as we couldn't feed one child, never mind three. So we... we... Uh, she tailed off. What did you do, Mum? Erin looked at her mother with a pained expression. Dad, please tell us, she implored. No more lies. The clock on the wall counted the empty seconds, beating a rhythm as regular as a heartbeat. For Erin, time stood still at that moment. She felt as though she was standing on a precipice, not sure whether to jump into the unknown or to go back to the past. One thing she was sure about was that after today, her life had changed forever. She had to plunge on and find out the painful truth. Patrick sat down wearily and rubbed his hand through his greying beard. You have to understand there was nothing else we could do. He paused. Your mum was so poorly and it was very distressing for everyone. Anyway, we went along to a special meeting where we were told they would set us up in great jobs. They would find us a beautiful house, good education for all our children on one condition. What condition, Dad? asked Mal. Stella took a deep breath, leaned forward and whispered. The one condition was that one of the twins would be educated away from home and we could only see her once every five years until she was 18 and then she could come home. Erin gasped. I don't understand. Patrick continued explaining, taking sips of whisky like full stops at the end of each sentence. They decided Miranda was the one to go away. It could so easily have been you, Erin. At this, Erin looked uneasily at her parents. They came to the hospital, did lots of tests and took lots of measurements on you both and then took Miranda away. We didn't see her again until her first birthday. We have regular updates on how she is. We sent pictures of all the places she's visited and they allow us to see her once every five years, like today. Miranda seems very happy at her school and the education she receives is superb. A very bright girl by all accounts. The photo album, Erin, exclaimed Mal. You're not going mad. The pictures were of Miranda. Stella stared at Mal in amazement. You've seen them? How? When? Erin explained about looking for birthday presents and coming upon the pictures. Stella put her head in her hands and began to rock back and forth. Patrick patted her shoulder, trying to calm her. Glancing his, his watch, he suddenly exclaimed, Goodness, it's way past midnight. Patrick swallowed the final drop of his whisky. He looked drained, Erin thought. Now I think it's time to get some sleep, Patrick continued. It's been a very long day and we're all exhausted. We can talk again in the morning. Miranda is fine and settled with her life. Don't worry, guys. Erin jumped up knocking the glasses and tiny bottles flying. So that's all right then, is it? Your explanation for hiding her all these years, all these lies you keep on telling us, that's made it all okay now. Erin stood breathing heavily. You sold my sister to... She searched her mind for the words. To, to someone and you don't even know who they are. Just so that you could have a nice life with your nice shop and your nice friends. You make me sick. You could have managed somehow. Her voice was rising as her emotions began to take over. How do you know she's happy? How do you know she's well cared for? You hardly ever see her. Erin was shouting now. She's part of me. She clutched her fist to her heart. I always knew part of me was missing. I always felt there was something not right with me and how you treated me. I need her. You might not, but I do. Erin grabbed her jacket and made for the door, pulling it open sharp, sharply. How could you do this? Her final question hovered in the air as she ran out and disappeared down the dimly lit hallway. As Erin stood silently waiting for the lift, 
Mal arrived, still looking shaken. <clears throat> I told them we would see them in the morning, he said, and as soon as the door slid open, they almost fell in. Once they were back in the car, they both relaxed. What do you want to do? Mal looked across at Erin, who suddenly seemed unsure of the next step. I don't know. I just had to get out of there to think. I can't take it all in. Nor me. I never knew, you know. I haven't lied to you like they have. Mal looked far into the darkness, as though he seemed to be remembering distant memories. I remember the strong smell of bleach when I was little, and it often made me feel sick. Mum was always crying too. I never knew she was ill. I used to think it was because I was very naughty. The bleach smell would have been the chemicals they used in the hair salon below your flat. Mal paused and then sighed deeply. That's not the first time I've heard the name Miranda. Mal looked across at Erin, who was now staring sharply at him. What do you mean? I remember Mum talking to Aunt Angela. They were arguing about something and Mum was really upset. Angela said Miranda was happy and in the right place. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I just assumed they were talking about a friend of theirs. Malachi dropped his head and mumbled. Sorry, Erin. That's all I remember. Erin glanced at him and realised he was exhausted. Her big, strong brother was silently crying. I've lost a sister too. He sniffed and wiped his hand across his face. Erin rubbed his shoulder for comfort and passed him a scrunched tissue she found in her pocket. I think we should try and get some sleep. It will all look better in the morning, Erin whispered, not really believing that. They pulled out their sleeping bags and pillows and each tried to get comfortable. Erin tossed and turned until finally falling into a deep sleep where dreams took her to a strange farmhouse where she was put in a cage and her parents ran off laughing with a girl that looked just like her. <laughs>